brought to you by Hula Frog, local things for kids to do. HulaFrog.com. Hello, and thanks for watching Illusionist Michael Howell Live. I'd like to thank our sponsor, Hula Frog. I also would like to thank our guest sponsor, Macaroni Kid. Another special thanks to Williams Magic Shop, Arizona Families, and Mildred and Dildred. If you guys want to know what supplies you're going to need for each episode, you can go to IllusionistMichaelHowell.com and click the Illusionist Michael Howell Live page link. The list will always be at the top of the page. Uh, um, for this episode, we do not have a supply list because we're going to spend more time talking to our guest and we're not doing science experiments this time. I'm going to show you guys a magic trick. I'm going to need my beautiful assistant, um, Jerrica, to come on. I have this beautiful blue poker chip, both sides of it. All right, Jerrica, open up your hand. I'm going to put the blue poker chip in your hand. Now squeeze it really tight. Okay, and on the count of three, what I'd like you to do is open up your hand. Ready? One, two, three. So the blue poker chip is now red. Show both sides. Yay, that's exciting. Okay, guys, now uh, upcoming events. Uh, we don't have a lot of upcoming events, but we just started doing these pop-up magic shows where we come to your house and uh, we do magic uh, and it's social distancing. It's a lot of fun. It could be for birthdays. It could just be for a fun family thing to do because it gets boring because we're social distancing and you're stuck at home. We pull up in our vehicle, we get out of the vehicle, put out our boombox, do our magic show, and then we drive off. It's a lot of fun. I'm also doing, uh, if you guys are looking for something fun to send to people for the, your anniversary, or if you guys wanna make your engagements exciting, uh, we're doing like social distancing, uh, magic grams and, and messages, which is pretty fun. Um, guys, I'm so excited uh, our, uh, about our guest. Our guest uh, is sponsored by Macaroni Kid. Please, Welcome, magically into the screen, Jed Dodds. Hi, thanks for coming on the show, man. Hey, thanks for having me, Michael. All right, so we're all excited, or we all want to know how the new elephant is doing. Uh, how's 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 Penzi? Penzi is doing great. Um, so she's, uh, let's see, she was born April 6th um, and uh, about 3.33 in the morning. And uh, she's doing fabulous now. Uh, she was born at a weight of about 295 pounds, uh, which is obviously a big baby, but elephants are big. And uh, the average is somewhere between about 240 and 300 pounds. So she was on the heavier side of that average. And um, now she's weighing in at over 420 pounds, um, which, is, which is great. It's a great growth for her. Wow. So she, she's, uh, she's growing pretty good. I mean, she's staying on the path she's supposed to be staying on then. Absolutely. And, you know, here at uh, the zoo, this is our second baby, um, elephant baby that we've had. So Nandi was the very first uh, elephant ever born in, in the state of Arizona um, and the first elephant ever born at Reed Park Zoo. So she will be turning six this year on August 20th. Um, so she is big sister. So Penzi was our second baby uh, and elephant babies are, uh, are, are pretty special uh, to have at a facility. They are fairly rare. Um, you know, the gestation period of an elephant is the longest of any mammal. So they have about a 22 month gestation period. So about 12 years or about two years. And, um, you know, then the turnaround cycle for a cow, a mom to have another offspring is somewhere around maybe five to six years because the elephant will nurse up to two to three years. Uh, so having a breeding herd of elephant is very unique, very special. Uh, we're very proud of that here at Reed Park Zoo. Uh, this started about 11 years ago when we built Expedition Tanzania in the expectation of bringing in a breeding herd. And Reed Park Zoo was the first zoo ever to move an entire established herd from one facility to another. So we work with San Diego Zoo Global, which is San Diego Zoo and the Safari Park. They're under the umbrella of San Diego Zoo Global. And we were able to move a mom, a dad, uh, two offspring and an unrelated adult female, which we call an auntie, um, that's Langili. And then, you know, fairly shortly after that, we were seeing breeding behavior between our big bull Mabu and our cow Samba. 
And as we know, Nandi was the result of that. Uh, that again, it was almost six years ago. And then um, about uh, two and a half years ago, uh, we were observing that breeding behavior again. Um, and of course, Penzi is the result of that. And a lot goes into the breeding of our uh, zoo animals. It's not you just put you know, a boy and a girl out there and just let them have babies. Um, everything is very highly regulated through what we call the SSP, which is the Species Survival Program. So there's an SSP for every species out there, and there's a stud book and a stud book keeper. And that stud book has the genetic lineage of every animal, who they are, where they've come from, um, who they're related to. And so what we look at with our zoos is not just what's good right now, but also 5, 10, 15, 20, 30 years down the road. How do we sustain some of these species within our zoos? And we work with the other AZA accredited zoos to come up with those solutions and move animals for breeding programs. And so Mabu, our bull, and Samba were given a breeding recommendation, and that's why we were able to have Penzi. Um, so we have to be very uh, smart and conscientious about how we breed and who's breeding with who so that we don't stunt the genetic lines. Um, Ten years down the road, we don't want every elephant related to Mabu. Uh, so there's um, a, a very strategic plan that goes into, again, how and why we breed. Um, and so, you know, Penzi is the newest member um, of the Reed Park Zoo family. And um, she's, she's absolutely extraordinary. And um, it's extraordinary to be able to watch an elephant go through a pregnancy, um, watch the family dynamics. Mm -hmm. And then when Penzi was born, not only to be able to observe this amazing little elephant, uh, but also the family. You yeah. know, the family plays such a critical role in the elephant uh, society. Right. That's so cool. That's so neat. Like, you have to go through all that. And um, definitely you don't want, like, family having babies of family. So that's really neat that they, you know, take those precautions. Um, how is she adapting into the elephant herd? Uh Amazing. And Nandi has taken on this amazing role of being this big sister. Uh, you know, you never really know how young elephants are going to react to another family member because it's the first time that Nandi has seen a baby. Uh, you know, so we weren't sure how she was going to react. First day when uh, Penzi was born, again, she was born early in the morning, about 3.33 in the morning on April 6th. You know, right after she was born, mom helps her up. Uh, so with her foot in her trunk, gets her up off the ground and um, starts checking. You know, that trunk is amazing. Uh, moms, elephant moms are super attentive to their offspring. And then very quickly after that, she was able to bring her outside to meet Nandi and Lingili. Uh, they were in an adjacent habitat, but they could still see and smell through the fence. And, um, you know, Nandi immediately was trunk on her, smelling, sniffing, super gentle. The trunk is extremely powerful, but also uh, can be very delicate. And Nandi was extremely interested in this new member of the family. That Later that day, they were able to introduce in the same space. And Nandi came running up and was big ears, um, super excited and you know was just wanted to figure out what this little thing was and i think then penzi was super interested in nandi and so penzi would start was following nandi around and nandi's kind of like backing up like oh my gosh like what is this thing following me um but now nandi's first thing that she does in the morning is goes and checks on penzi uh mm -hmm. and it's like how is my little sister and what is she doing? And, you know, I need to keep her safe. It's this, it's this attentive, attentiveness that these elephants have, this intelligence of what's going on that's so superior. And it's as extraordinary, again, to be able to watch this. And this is really great for Nandi because when she becomes a mom of her own, 
she will now know how to care for a cat. She's learning from Samba how to be a good mom. And right. this is a big problem that we've seen with elephants or with any animal that hasn't witnessed this of their own. They don't really know how to care for their offspring. And so a lot of times those offspring get rejected. But with Nandi, she's going through such a teaching and training right now with Penzi that when she becomes a mom of her own, there's no doubt that she's going to be just like her mom uh, and be able to raise some amazing elephants. That's so cool. Yeah, it's neat. Uh, animals learn from each other. So it's, I've seen like when I get new animals into the rescue or we just adopted two dogs. And so they're learning the good behavior from my other dogs, which is really neat. Yep. So, um, what, what's happening at Reed Park Zoo? I know we're in this pandemic and like, what, what are you guys up to at this moment? Like, yeah, so we are hopefully going to be opening up, um, either in middle of July or beginning of August. And, uh, right now it's somewhat business as normal. The animals don't know we're in a pandemic. Uh, <laughs> they need all the extraordinary care that we give every single day and we need to keep that up. Um, so the zookeepers are working just as hard as they ever have. Our veterinary team, our nutrition team, everybody is working to make sure that we are upholding the highest standard of handling and working with these animals that exist. And so, you know, it's kind of business as normal on that standpoint but it's very hard because we're not able to bring any of the guests in. So since the pandemic hits in March, um, we've had to shut down the zoo. Uh, we've had obviously Penzi that was born and we've had five little baby meerkats that were born, um, which are amazing. And we have a baby zebra that's on its way. Um, we're under pregnancy watch right now under the birthing window. Uh, and it's, you know, I go out there and it's so different because I sit here and I watch these extraordinary animals and they're telling us this story and I look behind me and there's, there's nobody there. And um, it, it's hard. We, we, you know, we exist to teach people about wildlife, mm -hmm. um, to connect people with wildlife in a way that you cannot do through a book, that you cannot do through a movie. Uh, we know that when you see an animal up close, you can connect with that animal. And when you can connect with that animal, that's where we can create that storyline of conservation. Mm -hmm. So we exist as an education facility where before now, half a million people um, would come through our gates every single year. And through doing that, we're able to teach people about animals from around the world and then turn that into a conservation message. So many of the species that we have are threatened species, are endangered species, are critically endangered species like our Malayan tiger. And these animals need our help. They need our help not only in our zoological facilities, but also where they live. And your local AZA zoo is the link between what these animals are doing here in the zoo and what we can do for them in the wild. So when we bring people into the zoo and connect them, that turns into that conservation. You know, I always say that, um, you know, you only can know what you see and, and through that, then you connect that to something that you're passionate about yeah. and that passion can turn into an action. Um, and that action can turn into saving species. Right. And that's why we're here. And so, you know, not having the, the public in has been, it been hard. Yeah. Um, but we have been able to find some really unique ways to be able to connect people. Um, I think everybody in every industry is looking, I, I mean, you yourself, Michael, are looking for those unique ways this channel exists because of the pandemic. Right, right. And trying to connect people in such a different way. So um, our webcams have, we've seen huge increase in traffic on our webcams, which is great because uh, people are seeing what we're doing. We're able to communicate through that uh, using all of our social media platforms uh, to be able to get videos out there. 
Uh, so people know about the Miracats, people know about Penzi because I'm out there with a GoPro and a camera and I'm getting these videos and I'm like, okay, people have to see this. Like, let's just push this out there everywhere. Right. Um, and we have such great response from that. That's great. Yeah, it's amazing how much we people are missing. I know I just went to see my nephews uh, and my niece and how much they've grown and how much I've missed. So it's great that you've, you're able to use the video to kind of keep everybody updated on the, on all of that because we don't want to miss it. Like that's stuff we want to see. So yeah, and I think, I think, you know, all of us and the animals are missing the people. Mm -hmm. uh, when you walk around, you know, that the animals respond to us, you know, they're, they're just, I mean, you, you have animals, you have an animal rescue, mm -hmm. like the animals respond to us. And, um, you know, I was walking over by giraffe and we do a giraffe feed every day. Mm -hmm. And since we haven't been able to do draft feed, I mean, the drafts still get interaction from the keepers, um, but it's different because, you know, they know the keepers every day. Uh, yeah. And so I was walking by and the draft were just like looking at me, like following me, like, <laughs> hey, hey, like, what are you, are you going to come give us some food? And um, <laughs> the same thing with our squirrel monkeys yeah. and, um, you know, even the lions, you know, I think the ones that, um, you know, don't necessarily miss everybody is probably the birds. Right. Uh, you know, the birds, it seems like they're in the aviaries, they're on the ground, they got their <laughs> wings out, and they're just like, we rule the world now. Uh, and if you walk in there, they all kind of look at you like, what, what, are you, what are you doing in here? Like, this is, this is our space. So they're, they're kind of funny. Uh, the you know, but they, the, the animals play off us just as much as we play off them. And, um, you know, we are creating those fun enrichment opportunities and the keepers are being challenged during yeah. this time to think even more outside the box uh, to make sure that the animals maintain that mental stimulation that they really want and they really need. So um, the keepers are getting very creative in, in unique ways, which is cool. That's so cool. Yeah, you know, I've noticed that I, I have animal rescue and the animals I do use in my show, they love performing. And when they're not doing it, they know they're super depressed. Yeah. So they need to yeah. keep up what they love. And, and that's part of what keeps them you know, going throughout their day. So I totally get that. What is your advice on somebody that wants to get into zoology or become a vet or work with animals? I teach a class with uh, Pima every summer. And one of my students, she said she's going to be watching, um, said she really wanted to become a vet, work with animals. Like, what's your advice to somebody like that? Hello, student that's probably watching, um, and get involved now. Um, I've been here at the Reed Park Zoo for 15 years, and prior to me coming to the zoo, I worked as a veterinary technician um, at a local vet hospital here in town, Suffolk Hills Pet Clinic, so a wonderful place up on Oracle and Ina, um, and uh, I have worked there for 10 years. So I started when I was uh, volunteering when I was 14, and then worked there all through high school, all through college, uh, my degree is a bachelor's degree in veterinary science, and then that got me a foot into the door. I became an intern at the zoo first, and then from there became a zookeeper, and then an educator, and um, now in my role as a supervisor where I get to do a lot of um, public presentations, media outlets, events, rentals, developments with our donors, um, and being able to kind of shape the zoo. So for you guys out there that are interested in any sort of an animal career, first broaden that vision. When I was a kid, I loved animals and I knew that I was going to work with animals in some capacity. I wasn't sure exactly what, but at the time I grew up thinking the only way I can work with animals is become a veterinarian. And I think so many of us think that the only way you work with animals is you become a veterinarian. And that is an amazing career. And if that is your path and your passion, then go for that. But broaden your view in thinking that there are other things out there. There are animal rescues. Um, there's being a zookeeper. There is conservationist. Um, there are so many other careers that give you an opportunity to fulfill that love that you have of animals that you may not know. So don't just go into it with a very narrow scope. Um, try to look outside, but get involved now. Get involved now in some capacity with some animal somewhere. Whatever your capabilities are, whatever your age is, there are certain requirements for places to be certain ages. So look into those different opportunities uh, because the animal field can be very competitive. 
And so you want to give yourself as much of a boost as you can when you're competing for those positions. Uh, for most positions, especially to be a zookeeper, uh, you do need a four year degree in some sort of a biology, ecology of evolutionary biology, veterinary science, animal science, um, and then a lot of psychology as well. The zoo keeping world has really changed uh, in the last decade to two decades into we are working a lot with positive reinforcement and more the psychology of animals is, uh, is definitely the, the path of the future. So if you're out there and you want to get a job working with animals, start now. Um, and again, it doesn't have to be something major. You know, there are so many rescues here. I mean, you know, I'm sure, Mike, you need help with yours. Always. Yeah, there's so many animals right now. We have over 75 from anything from birds to horses to goats. So many different types of animals. So, yeah, and yep. definitely. And then, and then stay, stay in school and, uh, you know, see where your path takes you. Um, again, I was so focused on becoming a veterinarian. You know, that was, that was going to be, that was my goal. That was my focus. And somewhere along the line, it changed. I did an internship here at the zoo and uh, fell in love with the zoo. I fell in love with the story. I fell in love with being able to connect people to wildlife. And, you know, 15 years later, I have been able to do some of the most extraordinary things on this planet. I've traveled the world. I've met amazing conservationists, uh, Jack Hanna, um, Lori Marker, Charles Foley, uh, Dr. Amstrop with polar bears, um, you know, great animal advocates like Betty White and uh, Dr. Jane Goodall. And these are people that I've shook their hands and given hugs to and heard their story. Um, I've traveled just recently to Tanzania uh, to meet up with Dr. Charles Foley, which is one of the conservation projects that we're involved with. And uh, stood in the Terengari National Park with a thousand elephants and learned what is conservation and how does a zoo play this critical role into it. Right. And 15, 20 years ago, I never dreamed of having those opportunities right. and being able to change people's minds and change the outlook of animals. And um, I always say my goal with what I do is to try to end extinction and which is a huge goal. I mean, people, you know, it's trying to end, you know, homelessness or end hunger and ending extinction. But if we don't strive for these big goals, okay. then what are we doing? If we don't challenge ourselves beyond what we believe that we can do, then what are we doing? And so my goal is to end extinction and to use every resource that I have to tell that story because we can all do small things to help that story happen. And you guys out there, you could be the next generation that's continuing that story. Right. And we always need the youth to be learning this stuff so they could work at the zoo. And, and I, I, I always worry that in today's world, we don't have enough, you know, youth going to college or learning about this stuff so they can keep on what you're doing, you know, keep that going. Um, so we're actually running out of time, but how could people um, uh, find out more about Reed Park Zoo and help maybe donate? I know you guys are probably looking for funding in this time. Uh, how can they support Reed Park Zoo in, in, this, in these times? Yeah, so great resources, our websites. There's a lot of great information on there. There's animal updates. There's our uh, zoo web cameras that you can link into to, you know, live, see what's going on here at the zoo. There's several opportunities to get involved, whether it's our Adopt an Animal program, which we just created a virtual Adopt an Animal program, um, whether it's a donation. Uh, we're now selling face masks because that's the thing to do. So we have these... Uh, Reed Park Zoo face masks, oh, right? Cool. You know, um, and there's there's ones that uh, there's ones that have Penzi on it, uh, our baby elephant. So all those things help support. All that money stays directly here at the Reed Park Zoo. Uh, the Reed Park Zoological Society is a 501c3 nonprofit. All of that money stays right here. So anything that you do to help us out, um, you know is gonna go directly back into the mission of Reed Park Zoo. 
Uh, we're also in a very exciting time that we've broken ground on the first phase of construction in the zoo. So we've started construction to our front plaza. So the entrance is going to be brand new and also our new flamingo habitat, uh, which will be up front in the zoo. So when you first walk in, you will see our amazing flock of Chilean flamingos. Uh, next phase is going to be working, expanding the zoo four acres to the west, creating a brand new Asia habitat. We're doing a 17,000 square foot tiger habitat, reptile house with Komodo dragons, large pythons. Uh, we've got red panda coming back. We've got monk jack. We've got sloth bear, uh, some amazing pheasants that are going to be highlighted in that Asia space. And then a really amazing world of play. Um, it's not a playground because it's so much more than that for our kids to you know, be able to play and interact on some different uh, continent inspired uh, play equipment, Antarctica, South America, North America. So there's a lot of really exciting stuff going on right now at the zoo. And we obviously need um, you guys to be able to continue that mission, that legacy for Tucson. Uh, Reed Park Zoo is such a gem for the city of Tucson. We are the number one, um, you know, highest trafficked um, attraction in Southern Arizona. And, you know, it's, it's because of the community and the support that's been behind Reed Park Zoo. We have some of the best members, some of the best patrons, and it's because of you guys out there that are supporting what we do that we're able to continue uh, this amazing mission that we're on and uh, to be able to bring all these great things to Tucson. That's awesome. And yeah, guys, make sure you support Reed Park Zoo. They're doing Incredible things we just heard. We got a lot of exciting things to come. Uh, you can go to their website. Again, thank you so much for coming on the show, man. It was an honor. I'm a huge animal lover. Uh, so thanks for coming on, man. Yeah, thanks for having us, Michael. And uh, hopefully we'll see you at the zoo at some point here. Hopefully, man. You take care. All right. Take care, guys. guys i love animals so much and it was such an honor to have jed dodds on our show wow that was just awesome guys um actually i'm going to show you guys some magic another magic trick i got a pan here guys don't try this at home because it's extremely dangerous i got my lighter fluid bum 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 super excited again don't try this at home and it's on fire well all right, it's on fire a little bit. You can see that. It's not really wanting the light. Maybe I'm gonna put a little, because I need a little more lighter fluid on there. It's more exciting when there's a big flame. Let's just say that. Guys, again, don't try this at home. Woo, that's a big flame. All right, now it's on fire. On the count of three, we're gonna say the magic words, hula frog, ready? One, two, three, hula frog. And we have a cute little rat. Her name's Phoebe. Big round of applause for Phoebe. Yay, Phoebe. Okay, guys, we have an animal rescue. It's called Rose Ranch Animal Rescue. You can go on the website, illusionistmichaelhowell.com. Click on Rose Ranch Animal Rescue, find out more information. Or if you look under Illusionist Michael Howell Live link, we are selling $45 t-shirts. 100% of that money goes to Rose Ranch Animal Rescue. I also have autographed pictures with me and an animal for a $10 donation. Or you can go to our GoFundMe, guys. Also, I have a fan club. Be sure to get your information on that. We send a lot of cool things out in the mail. Uh, and it's a lot of fun. All right, guys. It's that time of the episode where we get to tell you some corny, horrible jokes. 
Jericho, what did the skull say to the basketball? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> okay. Jerica, how do all oceans say hello to each other? How do all oceans say hello to each other? They wave. <laughs> ah. Okay. Why couldn't the pony sing himself a lullaby? Why couldn't the pony sing himself a lullaby? He was a little horse. <laughs> a little horse. <laughs> okay. How do you make an octopus laugh? How do you make an octopus laugh? With tin tickles. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and some joke special because we uh, had Pinzi, uh, the elephant, and Jet Dodds on. Uh, why are elephants so wrinkled? Why are elephants so wrinkled? Did you ever try to iron one? Oh! <laughs> okay, what wears glass slippers and weighs over 4,000 pounds? What wears glass slippers and weighs over 4,000 pounds? Cinderellaphant! <laughs> Cinderella elephant. Oh, that's good. All right, last but not least, how do you keep an elephant from charging? How do you keep an elephant from charging? You take away its credit cards. <laughs> oh! <laughs> All right, guys, you've been so wonderful. Thanks for watching Illusionist Michael Howell Live. Next week, we have our guest, John Shaw, Vegas magician, performer. It's going to be great. Make sure you check it out. And um, all of our guests are sponsored by Macaroni Kid. Thanks so much for watching and have a great rest of your day, guys.